In an effort to keep us relatively on track, we're about 25 minutes over. We'll make some adjustments during the lunchtime hour to try to get us back on track. We want to be ever considerate of our speakers, many of whom are coming over here to speak and then going back to the Epilepsy Society meeting. Um, I wanted to introduce to you Dr. Jay Salpakar, who is an internationally renowned physician and scholar in the field of neuropsychiatry. He is the director of the Neuropsychiatry in Epilepsy Program at Kennedy Krieger Institute and on the full-time neurology and psychiatric psychiatry faculty of Johns Hopkins University. And he's going to be talking today about the psychiatric comorbidities and behavior. Thank you. Okay, let me get oriented here. Okay, so, so this is, we're going to have some fun. We're going to think differently. I used to have these uh, slides with Steve Jobs and you know, Apple computer, think different. And it's a great way to go about this type of subject. Uh, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm kind of the last stop. You know, when you have tried to figure out other things and, and you come to me and then we speculate. And that's a lot of what I want to do today is speculate, think about what we face, because we face some tough, tough problems. I mean, we face some very difficult things. Our literature is not going to help us very much. We can sometimes compare anecdotes. But in doing this kind of work and dealing with difficult problems for many, many years, I just want to share with you at least a little bit of what I've learned and, and how I think about ways to treat and ways to manage the behaviors that, uh, that we face. Uh, now, after seeing Eileen at the Rare Epilepsy Network and thinking about the conversations that were happening there, I decided to go fully ahead with the, the speculative stuff and, and we'll just kind of imagine what we can do. And we'll base it a little bit on what's going on in the brain too. I think that in order to, to really know what we're treating and what we're doing, we have to go to our substrate. We have to think about the brain and how it is wired and how it works. And we might not have exact answers, but we want to think like that so that we can make some reasonable decisions. That's how we act when there's not a whole lot of information to guide us. So anyway, I'll do some of that. The neuropsychiatric is on purpose. I like saying neuropsychiatry, and I'm involved in the Neuropsychiatric Association. It's not really a pediatric-focused field at this point, although I'm working on changing that, recruiting heavily recruiting a little bit, as much as I can, to get more pediatric people involved in neuropsychiatry. But it, it does change the way we think about illness, psychiatric illness, neurologic illness, and where we go on from there. It's the interface of psychiatry and neurology. All of you know this, you live it. This has been going on for many years. The key is brain and behavior relationships. There's something about that even if we don't have the exact science backing it up, thinking about it, it's improving. But we think about brain and behavior relationships and that gets us thinking a little bit more about how we can solve some of these problems. But when we think about the brain and we think about neuropsychiatry, advancing the paradigm a little bit, we have to know how it gets there. We have to know certainly some details and by the way, with neuropsychiatry, it's just a little bit of a different archetype. But this is the big thing, growth and maturation. Everything that we do with pediatrics is, pediatrics is a moving target. Kids are a moving target. So we want to aim for where they are and think about what parts of the brain are growing and developing and see if we can intervene in an intelligent way. Uh, there's our friend, the hypothalamus. It does fine tune early. Uh, there are later maturing parts of the brain, and, and I won't get into all these details, but we think about the basal ganglia. These are central structures. These are way stations. They're routers, if you will. We think about late maturing brains. Temporal lobe, we're going to come back to that. That's in our neighborhood, and it certainly tells us a lot. And we think about psychiatry and neuropsychiatry about the temporal lobe. And then connectivity. We could spend an entire hour talking about any one of these areas right here. Brain development is key and I like uh, the way that Madison was talking about remodeling a house with the walls and you know paint and things like that. I think it, if we think about 
getting an old house up to code, that might even be a, a, a reasonable analogy. If you've got an old farmhouse built in 1900 and you want to try to get it up to electrical code for 2017, you're going to have to do some unusual things. You might have to, to, to route some wires up through the attic to get to the basement. You might not have walls that you can go through because they're, they're too cold or they're not insulated. Who knows? That's the kind of thing that I see happening with the brain through many years. Sensitive and critical periods. If you want to think neuropsychiatry and development, you want to think about capturing critical periods, sensitive periods when the brain is growing, when there's a lot of growth, and you want to capitalize on those things. And then you want to think about, and I firmly believe the brain grows throughout life. There are stem cells that divide throughout life, certainly in the dentate gyrus, other places in the brain, probably. It's a lot easier to grow the brain when you're young. It's a little harder when you get older, but it still can grow, a little bit different qualitatively. Um, I won't get into all these details, but... Uh, and then we're going to think psychiatrically. We still have DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's, it's kind of like democracy. DSM is the worst system in the world except for everything else. Well, that's, that's democracy, too. Uh, these are categorical symptoms. These are lists. These are checklists. They're not going to get... It's a, if you have a hypothalamic hamartoma or some other complicated neurologic condition, what checklist is going to be helpful for us? There's not going to be a ton of checklists that are going to fit very well into everything that we're going to do. What we're going to have to do instead is think dimensionally. Think about symptoms that overlap categories. So when I evaluate people, I try to depart from the categorical criteria. Now, granted, that means that you know, categorical criteria and, and diagnoses are everything that gives us FDA indications and clinical trials and, and all the class one data that we, we, we think that we want, all the evidence base that we think that we want, is based on things that are arguably fairly arbitrary. And, and that's, that's sort of the constraint that, that we have when we think diagnostically. So I prefer to think dimensionally. And when you think dimensionally, then you think we're not treating bipolar, we're not treating major depression, we are treating impulsivity. And that should be our target, because after all, that is the thing that overlaps many other disorders. So, when you, so this really is a paradigm shift in, in many ways. And it's hard to find clinicians, unless you're, you dive very deep into this kind of work, it's hard to find people that think dimensionally, that are going to be unique in terms of understanding behavior dimensions, and, and then design some sort of treatment that will make some sense. Uh, and we'll talk about treatment, I promise, and while promise, we'll save plenty of time for questions, too. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion about this. Anyway, those are not the only behavior dimensions, and, and we certainly talk about aggression, explosive mood, irritability, outward-directed irritability, extreme irritability. We can pick any number of rating scales that will categorize different sorts of irritability or nuances. Uh, explosive mood, there's ways that we can describe that that can be helpful for us. But notice that when it comes down to it in psychiatry, certainly in pediatric psychiatry, these are the things that we treat more than anything else. When you come in, you, you don't necessarily say, well, this is a problem with depression or this is a problem with ADHD. You might think that, you're not sure. Uh, but what you see are these things, and we try to decide, does it make sense to treat based on this, based on what we know dimensionally or what we know diagnostically. So anyway, that's, that's the landscape. And when we think about comorbidities and interdisciplinary conditions, I usually start with this and try to think about how we treat it. Uh, all right, epilepsy, we certainly know about this. Uh, I will talk just a word about bidirectionality. This is all the rage now, and you know, AES, you go to this meeting and any talk about comorbidity is going to mention bidirectionality now, which is great for me. This is so gratifying to see this happening now. Uh, it's been talked about for many, many years, but bidirectionality means that not only, as an example, depression, not only are you more likely to develop depression if you have epilepsy, but if you have depression, you're better than even odds for eventually developing epilepsy. 
is probably true for ADHD, although the data is a little iffy, and it may be true for autism spectrum, though it depends on how we define autism spectrum. There's some debate about syndromal, non-syndromal, social pragmatics, and other types of nuances. But the reality is that if we think by directionality for these conditions, even if it's true in a subset, then we are dealing with one condition that leads to different symptoms. Neurologic, seizures, plus psychiatric. One condition with both of those symptoms. Now in treatment, you can imagine, that's gonna make it hard. Do we treat things piecemeal or do we try to navigate treatment so everything makes sense? It's hard to know, but that's the idea. And when we think about epilepsy, I've been doing, treating epilepsy and thinking about epilepsy as an academician for 20 years. And more and more, epilepsy is an illness that I don't even think about with psychiatric comorbidities. I think of it as one illness, a neuropsychiatric condition with varying symptoms. So anyway, we could talk a long time about this too. <clears throat> For epilepsy, we're gonna see a lot of ADHD, we're gonna see a lot of autism spectrum, we're gonna see a lot of anxiety and depression. Uh, temporal lobe foci, some of our series, some of the historic literature to a degree, uh, we find more anxiety and depression if you have a seizure focus in the temporal lobe. That's what we're finding. Uh, whether they're refractory or chronic, uh, nuance that not so much just because we don't have that data, but, but I have gotten to the point where I think about temporal lobe as risky for development of anxiety and depression, more than, more than other types of localizations. All right, here's our friend, the limbic system. It's fun to talk about the limbic system. Everybody's interested. It's like, ooh, that's your personality, and things like that. And it's true. It's, it is interesting to think about that. Well, so our friends in the limbic system, we certainly have our, our, uh, our amygdala, and our hippocampus, we've got a lot of other things too, and notice that it, it spans the entire part of the brain. Oh, and by the way, our best friend, the hypothalamus, is, is, is sitting right in there. It's a very tiny thing sitting there, as you know. Uh, but the amygdala, let's, let's talk about the amygdala, and this is a classic, classic experiment from Pierre Glore years ago, um, taking refractory, uh, people with refractory epilepsy, and, and did neurosurgery and stimulated seizure foci in, in different parts of the brain. Uh, and if you stimulate the amygdala, you get a fear response. If you have someone with a panic attack, and then you have somebody right next to them with a seizure focus in the amygdala, they look very similar, especially in the early stages of the attack, the first few seconds. They both have a sudden onset of fear, anxiety, uh, for sense of foreboding feel like they might be going crazy, like they're having a heart attack, this unsettled sensation. Uh, sometimes they can even have epigastric rising. Uh, they can have uh, dizziness. Uh, anyway, so there's overlap, and the amygdala is an important structure for us. And of course, our HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, and this will all make sense in a few more slides, I can promise you that. But we're thinking about the brain, and we're thinking about where does psychiatry live in the brain, where do some of our behavior dimensions that get us in trouble, where do they live in the brain too? Hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, it, it, pro, it matures early, it fine tunes early. And of course, back in medical school, I, I was always very intrigued by every single diagram. Well, stress will play a role. They have these, you know, stress, boom, that can play a role in just about every disease. It comes up. Do we know how? No, not really, but stress. Now we know how for the hypothalamus, right? I mean, any, has, has anybody seen, probably, probably the clinicians, anyone seen a patient with a pheochromocytoma? Yeah? Pheochromocytoma, all right, yeah. Pheochromocytoma is, is basically a tumor of the adrenal gland, so you have excessive adrenaline. Uh, these people are very nervous, very excitable. Uh, it's a terrible, terrible disease. It's very, uh, uh, it's a huge burden, but uh, you can imagine if you have excessive adrenaline uh, that it can cause a huge problem. What if you don't necessarily have hugely excessive but you have just a little more or the regulation is not fine-tuned? Well, that happens when your hypothalamus isn't quite right. Um, let me skip ahead. Where am I going here? 
I think that we can, just, just to know, and everybody here, I'm sure, has studied this kind of diagram and thought about the hypothalamus over and over again and where it's connected. I mean, you know these pathways. You've thought about this a lot. Let me digress just a little bit and talk about, well, I'll leave the picture up, and talk a little bit just about stress and what that, what that does. And I said before, this is going to be a teaser. We're going to talk a lot about anecdotes. We're going to think about how the brain is wired and how different environmental factors might influence the brain. So when you are stressed, what happens is you have a cortisol response to some degree. That plays an impact on so many other parts of, of the brain, and you get fine-tuned. We talked about adrenaline a little bit. We talked about, and, and, and basically what that means is there are big systems of the brain that are involved, big systems of the body. You can divide up the body into sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. Yeah, again, just roughly, we're thinking about it. Sympathetic is fight or flight, adrenaline. Parasympathetic is sit back, relax, digest food, contemplate. Your whole body, your whole brain is oriented to sympathetic or parasympathetic. We see people sometimes with hypersympathetic states. Maybe they're, you know, a little hyped up, a little excited. They got a lot of adrenaline. They're jumpy. Um, maybe there are people with excessive parasympathetic states or parasympathetic tone. Maybe they're not as active. They're relaxed. They're too laid back. They don't move around too much. Who knows? There are ripple effects for all this. And I'm not even trying to be you know, exact, but I, but I do think this matters for how we think about hypothalamus and all the ripple effects from the hypothalamus too. Sympathetic is what keeps, keeps you sharp, keeps you out of danger. If you turn on your adrenaline, then you're fight or flight. You can get away from danger. But the sympathetic tone or high sympathetic tone is not good for neurogenesis. It's not good for brain growth. The organism will sacrifice brain growth, like we talked about brain growth, dentate gyrus. That will not happen in people with high sympathetic tone. And if you think about it, parasympathetic tone, being relaxed, that's when you have your best ideas, right? If you're sitting back, Isaac Newton, just relaxing, all right? Then gets hit in the head with the apple. Oh, gravity, great. Yeah, Archimedes, you know, taking a bath. Oh. You know. Great, density, buoyancy. Um, that's when a lot of the brain growth occurs. That's why you have to sleep in order to consolidate, to, to grow your brain. Now, wow, we've sort of got into something here. You know, the hypothalamus regulates HPA axis. We know that stress makes the brain not grow as much. If everything is tied into this, then no accident that we uh, were chasing some, some difficult problems and we, we, we wonder about the fine tuning. Anyway, I, th there's a lot of more digression I could go into, but in, in the interest of time, I don't want to go too far into this. Let's instead um, think about the temporal lobe again. Actually, I'm going to go back to this picture. Think about the temporal lobe and just to remember how close these things are related. Um, anybody know what the, we talked about the amygdala, the hippocampus, anybody know what the job of the amygdala is in the brain? No? The amygdala, everything that comes in to the brain, all sensory information, basically gets a carbon copy, gets equal message sent to the amygdala. The amygdala's job is to decide how much emotional reactivity do you need to have to incoming information. Should we be afraid? Should we not be afraid? That matters, right? And it certainly matters if your hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis is not as fine-tuned. All right, anyway, we have seizures. We have a hamartoma. This is all intimately related with the amygdala, hippocampus. They're at least connected in circuits. And the temporal lobe is where we see a lot of our psychiatric problems. We certainly see anxiety and we certainly see mood disorders, and then we see impulsivity also. So anyway, I want to get to what you really want to hear about, which is this. Um, 
we can think about aggression and the hardest thing to do, and raise your hand if you agree, the hardest thing to do is to figure out, is this because of the you know, hematoma, is it because of the neurologic state, or is it something else? I mean, that's, that's the hardest thing to sort out. Yeah. Um, this is the way that I think about it. We can divide, just to say aggression as an example, divide it into spontaneous and reactive. If we have somebody, you know, a child who is sitting very happy, playing with some toys, you know, maybe a favorite object or a book, and then all of a sudden they jump up and start screaming, throwing everything around, terrorizing people, um, terrorizing themselves, that's spontaneous. There's no reason for them to jump up and react like that. Whereas if they're sitting comfortably and all of a sudden, uh, you know, someone says, hey, listen, it's time to, to go. We're going to be late. You know, it's time for lunch. It's time to move. You've had enough time doing that. Let's get dressed. Time to use the bathroom. Uh, anything to disrupt. And then we have an aggressive reaction. Well, then that's reactive. We can kind of separate these reactions out. And it's very hard because we have to think about a lot of details. We can separate these reactions out into spontaneous and reactive. We're essentially trying to decide if we're in medication territory or not. If the reactions are spontaneous and they're severe, then we probably need to help the HPA axis a little bit. We probably need to add some, uh, some reduce some sympathetic tone, if you will, reduce some of the overactivity, and use a medicine to at least tune down the system a little bit. That's probably what we're looking for. If it's reactive, and slowly develops, or even if the spontaneous reaction is mild, then we might be able to get away with some sort of redirection or behavior modification. These are the kind of things that we think about. Now, if you want to you know, get details, we're going to have to think about drug reaction stressors. Do we actually have a, a meaning for the aggression? Is there uh, some sort of physiologic need? Are there details? So when people call or they come in and tell me, hey, there are aggressive reactions, this is what I'm going to ask. I say, well, tell, talk me through one of these reactions. Tell me the details. What happened before? Who else was in the room? How much lighting was there? Was it noisy? Was there something new? Were they wearing tight clothes? Was there, uh, were they hungry? Had they, uh, you know, is their toileting status not uh, at equilibrium? It, whatever we need to, to think about to give us a clue whether we can call this spontaneous or reactive. And sometimes it's a hybrid, but we're really thinking about how to treat and whether we're in medication territory or not. All right, um, you know, Madison talked about this kind of thing and I thought it was great. I'm not gonna belabor this. Uh, certainly predictability, structure, communication, you can do all that kind of stuff, coordinate. But what we really wanna do is think about medicines here. If you know, you're going to do all the, the other stuff anyway, and I don't mean to short shrift that at all. We spend a lot of times talking about it, and I think it's important. Um, but think about our anticonvulsants. We might already have the best tools available for impulse control. Anticonvulsants are first line treatments for things like bipolar disorder, manic depression. What is manic depression? It's a problem with regularity, with control, with impulsivity with your mood swings. Sometimes you start talking fast. Sometimes you don't sleep. There's a circadian rhythm that could be awry with uh, bipolar disorder. Oh, and we can use anticonvulsants to treat it. We might have the best things already available to us. And seizure control, if we, sometimes if we can use a low dose of an anti-epileptic drug, we can actually improve behavior. Sometimes if we improve seizures, the behavior also improves as well. We have a lot of choices, and we can dive down into any of these, you know, if, if you want to. Um, certainly our mood stabilizers, anticonvulsants, uh, sometimes serotonergic agents. If we, we think that we have a behavior dimension that's more of a mood state, we can do that. Uh, we can talk about drugs that reduce noradrenergic effects. Back to adrenaline again. You know, that's what's getting us in trouble. You know, if somebody's in a, in a high or has a high parasympathetic tone or is, is not in a high sympathetic state, they're not going to be in a rage attack. All right? You require some sort of high adrenergic tone to, to have a rage attack. It doesn't happen otherwise. So maybe we use medicines to calm it down. 
I mean, I, I don't like giving kids beta blockers. Sometimes they have to. Uh, but alpha-2 agonists, clonidine, and guanfacine, sometimes those are good choices. And then if you think about a stimulant, sometimes these rages occur because you sort of lose focus. You sort of lose track of what you're doing and what fills in the gap, just something that's very unsettled, something that's confusing, disorienting. Sometimes you can actually use a stimulant in this, in this way too. At least if you have the opportunity to redirect behaviorally, if they have a stimulant, they might be able to receive that information a little bit more efficiently. So anyway, um, these are all good, good uh, targets. I think I'm going to skip through, you know, all these details. You will have the reference, and I'll make sure you get a copy of these slides, too. Um, anyways, this is just how we think about different types of, I'll go back to this, how we think about different types of anti-epileptic drugs. Can we get some mileage out of those medicines in order to help us with impulse control, redirecting aggression, reducing adrenergic tone to some way, if we think we're in medication territory, after all. So. Anyway, um, I think the first thing that we want to do, you know, you've, you've got rages, you've got aggressive behavior, how do we sort this out? We want to make sure that it's not a side effect, so you know, we're not creating more of a problem. We want to talk, talk about antecedents or talk about what's the context, what's going on. Um, social situations sometimes. Sometimes it, you just, and this is with any kind of kid. I mean, you, you don't always get it right as a parent. I mean, it's, it's hard to, to navigate, you know, what your kids can do, what they can't do. Sometimes you don't know if they need a nudge uh, or if they need to be uh, sort of comforted and placated for, for whatever stressor they're, they're going through. Um, sometimes you, you will get a rage or an explosion because there's a mismatch. There's just, you know, okay, yeah, they really couldn't handle that situation, and that was too too disorienting, too disturbing, they were not comfortable, maybe. And then we think about targets of treatment, sleep, energy, appetite, uh, attention, flow of thought, and that's sometimes how we can get to use a stimulant versus some other kind of medicine. Uh, but I usually start with anti-epileptic drugs. Let's see if that can give us some synergy. Um, anyway, seizure control, behavior improvement might go together. Think about the new paradigm. Think about whether it's spontaneous versus reactive, and then consider anticonvulsants maybe as your first line. If you're not gonna, if you've maxed out the anticonvulsants or that doesn't necessarily get you there, then you might wanna think about uh, other types of medicines as adjuncts, depending on what behavior dimension we're after, we're trying to treat. Temporal lobe, if we've got some kind of action or extension in the temporal lobe for hypothalamic hamartomas, it's, it's, it's in the neighborhood. Everything's wired in parallel. We, uh, the amygdala is waking up every time the hypothalamus says, whoop, you know, get going, hyperadrenaline. The amygdala is like, okay, I'm trying to keep up with all the information now, and I'm, fra I'm afraid. That's uh, what the amygdala is doing. Um, and then bidirectionality. Anyway, that's, uh, this is a program that we run. I'm in Baltimore. If you want to call, come in, you know, please let me know. Just uh, so I know who you are, tell me that you're from here <laughs> so I, I have a reference point. Um, and I'd be happy to take questions or whatever you want to think about or talk about. So. Yes. Uh, how can we know the difference between, for example, people giving to like having a, I don't know how to say it, to like a, because he's very, like, he does whatever he wants to do. I don't know how to say it, but he's like a very attentive kid. Okay. Sure, yeah. So, so I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but, well, uh, what I'm, let me see if I can 
you know, start with articulate at least what the question might be. So you're wondering if, if your child is doing various activities and is attentive to those activities, but then somehow loses focus or loses track of it. Is that because of the HH or is it because of something else? Okay. So your daughter sometimes will refuse to do things that you want her to do, and you don't know if she's just being stubborn or if it's because she can't attend because of the HH. Yeah, like well, ask these questions. Think about, yeah, so think about whether it's if you're asking uh, her to do something that she should want to do or that she would ordinarily like to do. You know, go eat ice cream. And if you get, no, I don't want to eat ice cream, well, then, then maybe there's something you know, physiologic or something hardwired that is making her hesitant or resistant. If it's just something I'd prefer to do, you know, gosh, Dad, I'd prefer to do what I'm doing right now instead of you know, what you're telling me to do, only you're getting no uh, instead of that. It, sometimes that is just, well, I'm opting out. Some of it is being manipulative, too. I mean, look, you've got... It's just because you're in some sort of, you know, neuropsychiatric, special needs, atypical, you know, uh, bizarro world, if you will, I mean, we all know what it is, uh, just because you're there doesn't mean you're going to have uh, a teenager, you know, resistance, you're going to have oppositionality, uh, you're still going to get it. You'll still get it all the time. We have these in kids who are uh, nonverbal autistic spectrum, you know, some of them will come in and be like, you know what, you're just being a teenager. Sometimes we call them three nagers. Uh, but you know, you'll still get, you know, things like that. But think about whether it's something that she would ordinarily want to do, and you're like, why on earth are you not wanting to do this? Then maybe it's something about anxiety, hesitance, resistance, being unsettled, unsure. It still may not be the HH. But at least it tells you that there's some there's more layers than just I don't want to do it. Yeah. It's hard to get a reference point. It really is. Every kid is gonna do worse when they're tired, worse when they're sick. They're they're gonna be more oppositional, more unsettled, more anxious, more cranky, and then and then it's unpredictable. You're not gonna get it right and pick right. 100% of the time. Nobody does. You know, as a parent, you're just going to miss sometimes. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so, just, uh, you know, I just want to ask you mentioned about like, sleeping disrupted. Mm. So, basically, my baby is about 17 months old. He has the surgery like two months ago. The seizure was pretty controlled, like three, only three or four times a day. Mm -hmm. But still, he has like very strange sleeping behavior, mm. which means that he slept about 10, but he will wake up at 12, 3, and 6 like three times a night pretty mm. regularly. And okay. sometimes he just wake up and play by himself for half an hour and go on sleep again. Mm. So is this something that you will treat or you will give some medication or you have some suggestion for this kind of strange behavior? He didn't have seizure. Like when he wake up, he didn't have yeah. seizure. He just yeah. wake up in the night and play for half an hour, sometimes even one hour, and going to sleep again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so the question is about uh, sleep disruption and yeah. sleep irregularity in a 17-month-old. Uh, so uh, I'm hard-pressed to treat sleep with a medicine at that age. I get skittish, anybody under three, uh, and I'm just you know, a nervous person like that. But, uh, but sometimes if you have to, you want to see progress. You want to see longer sleeping times because that is where you develop, grow, consolidate, uh, and mature. You want these networks to mature somehow. If you've got so many seizures that you can't mature the networks and have regular rhythmicity or, you know, like on an EEG, if you can't, if you don't have mature patterns because of a lack of sleep, then you want to do something. If you're using, well, let me just add one thing. If you're using an anticonvulsant already, then you might want to change, space out the dosages a little bit to try to get the benefit of some sedation so you can have a lengthier sleep period. That just might be one strategy. And he has under some like anti 
uh, like Caesar medication, not anticonvulsive, but anti Caesar like Trilactyl. And he, it's very strange that during his uh, wake up during the night, he just don't have any Caesar. He just start playing by himself for half an hour. So it really yeah. makes us really like, you know, hello. It's, he's got things to do. Yeah, <laughs> he's got to figure something out. Yeah. I know that's it. And you can be like, you know, it's just, you know, in tears, like, please go to sleep, child. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I don't know. Maybe you gratify that. Maybe you just say, okay, well, it's going to be another coffee day, you know, and some I'll sleep in maybe next year. It's hard. It's, it's, it's a hard road, and it's a hard life. I'm absolutely gratified and relieved in a lot of ways that you all have each other, because this, the worst problem is when you're isolated and you know, if you've got your kid and they have some rage attack and you're like, okay, where can we go? Now we have to hide everywhere we go now. We, have, you know, we can never go back to that store again. We'll never go back to that restaurant. Again. You have this long list of places that's like, let's just drive past that. I have my own PTSD. Sometimes it, you know, that can happen. So, so you're like, well, you're in this territory and they're, if, if they're having a good time playing with something, thinking about something, hey, maybe that's good. Maybe that's good for the brain. So let's move over here. Yes. Sure. So, so the question is, uh, in a five-year-old that you know had surgery and the seizures uh, got better, but the behavior got worse, got more aggressive or, or unsettled. So you're thinking about different behavior strategies like ABA, which is Applied Behavior Analysis, all commonly used in uh, developmental disabilities, autism spectrum, you know, things like that. Uh, and is that useful or is a medicine a better idea? The nice thing about behavior therapy, and ABA is one type, the nice thing about uh, you know, any type of behavior therapy is you impart structure, predictability, and routine. Anything you can do in a five-year-old that will have them structured and have them have a predictable response to their actions, and then anything that you do that gives them control and then receiving a predictable response so they can volitionally do something and get a response will help them navigate and manage and, and do, do better. Similarly, limit setting. If you can somehow redirect behaviors that are more positive or less destructive, if they do anything that's you know, unacceptable or untoward or, or, or just a little impulsive, well, you can also redirect those. And, and, and there are different philosophies about how much you actually intervene versus you know, rewarding positive things versus ignoring negative things. I mean, it's hard to, to get that exactly right. But I think for, for anybody, if the more that you can do that's structural, that's based on routine and predictability, sometimes you have to be like minute to minute. Like, OK, we're going to wake up. We're going to, this minute we do this. You know, somebody talked about having pictures on the mirrors. Uh, you know, to remind you, brush your teeth, this, this. The more that you have programmed out, especially for a five-year-old or that age, really up to about seven or eight, the better off you are because that's how kids will learn. They want structure. They need it. In terms of medicine, if you're finding that you have really good quality behavior therapy and you've done, you've read every book that's on the market and thought about this and talked to people and you've got structure, it's still not working, that's when you use a medicine. And in a five-year-old, I think more about these alpha-2 agonists, like aconitine, guanfacine. I think they're pretty gentle in a five-year-old, and, and you can usually get them to work if you don't have other choices with anticonvulsants or, or things like that. So. Sure. Think about what sensory integration does, you know. You're essentially getting all of these inputs to your thalamus, to your amygdala, and you're fine-tuning them. You're giving information, 
you're creating sort of a balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic, and you're allowing kids to receive this different information and not be upset by it or overwhelmed by it. So it's a pretty good thing for HH. I think anything that you do that, that helps fine tune so that you're not, you, you don't want to have this roller coaster ride. You want to be able to go kind of even as much as you can, and sensory integration is pretty good for that. Now there's some debate about who should do the sensory integration, what kind of things you need to do, what age it's most effective. Um, some people say it's most effective, you know, younger. I've had kids who are eight years old that, that do a pretty good job. I spend a lot of time in, you know, in my office, we, you know, rather than formal sensory integration, if you can do things like uh, music and movement, I think those are great things because these are other ways in, you know, other sensory avenues that you get into the brain, you make the brain process things, and you make it relax, you make, you unlock other stuff, and anything you do like that can help fine tune. Gets, the, gets rid of the roller coaster, stays on an even keel. So, so I think that's good. Uh, by the way, not necessarily for HH, but I like musical instruments, uh, especially if you can do both hands. Drums are great. Drums are no louder than any other instrument, trust me. You, know? uh, you can do that type of thing. And I think also uh, if you can do movement, uh, you know, anything where you, you move around, uh, and you want to have it be, you know, bilateral, because that's, you know, we, we're looking for, we're looking to grow brain, and we can do it if we have the other roads in, and we're not so hyper adrenergic that we prevent these connections from forming. So, anybody else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I think that can be very helpful. Um, most of the time, th there's good information that could come from a sleep study. Uh, you do want to see when the REM cycles occur. You know, if they occur earlier in the night versus later in the night. You want to make, you want to see how the stages work out too. And, and sometimes you can use medicines to try to influence that to some degree. A lot of the older kids or young adults that have sleep disruption, there's sort of a, a a quasi mood disorder that's underneath this. So if you see other symptoms like anxiety or mood or depression, and but your biggest problem is sleep, you might be looking at a mood disorder. Uh, and that's just that that's the categorical category, but maybe an antidepressant, especially something that can help with sleep, something that's sedating like citalopram or metazapine or something like that, that can actually, you can give at night, get a reasonable sleep schedule. And it takes time, it takes a couple of months to, to really normalize these stages and, and get to where you, where you need to be. Well, sure, if you sleep better, if your circadian rhythm is more regular, all of a sudden your adrenergic state is gonna be a little bit more fine-tuned also. So, so these, are, these are other roads in that I think we can do. But yeah, you gotta be clever about you know, thinking about sleep in terms of underlying mood and, and, and sometimes that helps you with medicines. It doesn't have to be a, an antidepressant. Sometimes it can be you know, some other sleep medicine that can, that can be helpful too. So, thank you. Thank you very much.